everyone, I'm Libby Hopoff. I'm the Program Manager and Audiovisual Archivist for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound, or MEPOPS, and I'm also the Audiovisual Archivist for the Seattle Municipal Archives. Hi, I'm Andrew Weaver, and I'm the Media Preservation Librarian at University of Washington Libraries, Seattle, Washington. And I'm Dave Rice. I'm the co-chair of the EMEA Open Source Committee. We would like to begin by acknowledging that MEPOPS is located on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish tribes, past and present, and honor with gratitude the waters and the land itself, along with the peoples and cultures that have existed here since time immemorial and continue thriving here today. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with Indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land we are on. Welcome to our EASA 2022 Project Overview for DV Rescue. In this presentation, we will demonstrate the current development status of DV Rescue tools, summarize project conclusions, and describe future work for digital videotape preservation. DV tape refers to a family of digital videotape formats including Mini DV, HDV, DV Cam, and DVC Pro, commonly used from 1995 through the 2010s. The affordability and compact size of DV tape enabled many cultural, journalistic, and humanities organizations to create unique audiovisual documentation for the first time. These formats were not commonly used for media distribution. Thus, a collected DV tape is likely a camera original or a unique recording rather than a copy. DV tape is far more susceptible to contamination, damage, decay, and environmental factors than any other videotape format from the same time period. At the peak of its era, DV was well supported by multiple software applications such as Live Capture Plus, DV Grab, and Final Cut Pro 7. However, now nearly every application supporting the transfer of DV is unsupported. Websites are offline, aged applications are difficult to access, and such applications do not or cannot run natively on modern computers. Premiere Pro and QuickTime can both still transfer DV tapes, however, they do not capture the raw DV stream. Funded by a research and development grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, DV Rescue is a set of tools designed for preserving archival videotape in DV formats. Since May 2019, this project has developed procedures and tools that support migrating data from DV tapes into digital files suitable for long-term preservation. This has helped fill an urgent need for DV tape transfer tools that can rescue content from at-risk digital videotape formats. During this project, we have been and will continue working to develop open source and freely available software, user research and testing, and create documentation to help define and perform comprehensive, automated, and easy to use data migration techniques. As part of the collaborative effort, MePops and Rice Capades selected and invited a group of participating institutions currently collecting DV videotape to allow us to conduct research, define preservation workflows, establish standards, and develop the most impactful tools for capturing content from DV videotape. Our participating institutions include the groups represented on this slide. At the beginning of the project, we took an initial survey of our participants. The gathered data aided the development process based on group-specific needs. In order to determine which groups could test components related to specific formats, we requested information regarding DV formats they had in their collections and which of these they were able to transfer in-house with decks they currently owned. To ensure that DV Rescue would be compatible with the workflows of our test group, we also inquired what types of operating systems they were using along with which capturing softwares. To ensure effective instructions for using the tools and provide a variety of resources, we wanted to make sure we accommodated all learning styles and skill levels. This is a MEPOP standard, but we consistently pull users to ensure we are addressing their needs. The tools included in the DV Rescue software are DV Guidance, DV Capture, DV Analysis, including DV Play filters and DV Loop functionality, DV Packager, and DV Merge. The current state of each of these tools will be demonstrated in this presentation. Hi, I'm Dave Rice, and I'd like to review the latest research and development work review on the DV Rescue project. And everything that we've been working on in the graphical user interface is tying together these different components of processing DV tapes, um, just to kind of connect the whole workflow together. So the first major component of this is capture. So we have this interface where you can review multiple decks, um, queue them up to what you want to transfer, name your transfers, and monitor the transfer as it is taking place. As the transfer is complete, 
those files kind of accumulate in this file table uh, at the top here. This file table is shared across other interfaces as well. Uh, so when your tape is done recording, you have like this little table of metadata about it. Uh, so from here, you can go over to the, the second major part, the workflow, which is analysis. Uh, here you can review the file that you have. You can see how many errors there are across the recording. You know, get information about the video and audio uh, errors of, of the recording and determine if the file you have suffices as a preservation copy or if you might need an additional transfer. Uh, in the analysis tab here, I'll just kind of peek at this section a little bit. Uh, there's one part here called DV loop, and this is accessed by clicking on the file number in the frame table. So if you select a frame, uh, you can open it up in the DV loop viewer. And here you get this kind of correlation between how the frame looks visually and the stored hexadecimal data of the frame, uh, which for NTSC is about 1500 rows of 80 byte blocks. Uh, so in here, you can kind of filter it out and you can just look at those blocks that hold audio data or those that hold uh, subcode, which is like the timecode information or those that hold um, video. And then you can kind of like see which ones hold uh, errors in the, in the video section and correlate it to like where those errors are in the frame. So you can kind of see these yellow blocks here depicting the video error concealment. And this is just like parts of the tape that were misread by the deck, so it concealed it by copying from the, uh, from the prior frame. And then back on the analysis tab, um, I mean, this just kind of summarizes all the metadata about the recording that you have, both in a timeline form and a table. Uh, from here, if everything looks good, the next uh, third part of the, uh, the workflow to show here is packaging. So here are all the recordings that you have uh, and analyzed are accumulated, and then you can decide how you want to package them. And this was spoken to a bit elsewhere, but uh, generally you'd want to take your DV and encapsulate it into a container format like QuickTime or Matroska. So at this phase of the graphical user interface development, we're gradually tying together these different components in order to make a more seamless transition to go from capturing data to analyzing that data and then packaging that data for long-term storage. So we're going to talk about frame filtering. So sometimes on a DV tape, there's a situation where, like suppose you have a, a DV tape and you're making a dub to another DV tape. So one tape goes in one deck, one goes in another deck, you hit play on one, you hit record on the other. And then when the playback tape finishes, the recording deck doesn't necessarily have anything to keep recording, but it's still going to keep recording. Um, so often the playback deck just sends continuously a copy of the last frame. Uh, and actually what it's doing is it's sending information to say that there is no frame. It's just, it's sending a concealed frame and it's just copying the last frame it had over and over again to fill that space. So if you're, if you're making a dub and your source tape is five minutes, but it takes you like 10 minutes to go and hit the stop button on your on your recording tape, uh, you can have all these extra frames. So sometimes there's lots of gray frames or just like the stuck scene. This can also happen when you're recording a tape from a source that is paused. Um, in the recorded tape, uh, there's notes to say that these frames are fully concealed. So one of the options we have in the command line tool in DV Rescue now is to filter these frames out, so you don't necessarily have to have concealed frames, because generally they don't contain any unique information. There's no motion, it's just a copy of a previous frame that was received. Uh, so sometimes by filtering them out you can remove like that last five seconds of a stuck frame at the end of a recording. So we're hoping to make this an option in the graphical user interface uh, too, so people can decide if they want to keep these frames or not, uh, because they definitely add to the duration, but they don't necessarily add to the content. Another type of filter we have in frame filtering is to filter out frames that aren't at uh, standard playback speed. Uh, so for instance, in the software, we want to be able to shuttle a deck around to like hit record, uh, I mean, to, sorry, hit rewind, uh, fast forward, pause, uh, so a user can see what the DV deck has while it's shuttling the tape around. 
Um, so you can play a tape, you can realize, okay, you want to back the tape up a little bit, so you hit the rewind button, and then you see like the frames kind of scramble as they're going backwards, because you're getting little pieces of multiple frames in the output. So in for the software, we still want to receive those frames so people can see what they're doing, even though even if they're fast forwarding or rewinding. But we don't necessarily want to record those frames because uh, it's just the sort of effect you get when you're using a deck in a non-standard direction or speed. Uh, fortunately, in the DV encoding that the computer receives, there's a little note to say like what direction and speed uh, each frame is at. So if the frame is at standard forward playback speed, we could say, okay, we want to record all those frames. But if we receive a frame that is not at standard playback speed, and it, as if it's like the tape's going backwards or it's going slower or in faster, like in a fast forward mode, we can filter, filter those frames out so we don't necessarily record them. Uh, so, so those are the options here you can see in the command line tool just to kind of pass them through or ignore those. Uh, frame uh, options by frame filter, and we're hoping to put these into the into the graphical user interface soon, so that when somebody's recording from a DV tape, they can kind of decide do they want those sorts of frames or not. Another thing to update you guys about is uh, security, uh, particularly as it relates to the Mac operating system. So the Mac operating system essentially calls any type of video input accessory uh, a camera. So when you when you start up DB Rescue on a Mac, it's going to give you this little permission um, request to say like, is it okay if this software accesses a camera? And in DB Rescue, like we're not trying to grab your webcam or get videos of you digitizing tapes. Um, it's just that's what it calls essentially like all, all video inputs. So in the Mac operating system audiovisual framework called AV Foundation, um, a, a Firewire plugged in uh, DV deck is essentially the same thing as a camera to the operating system. So it asks you for permission to be able to use it. Uh, the software also needs to ask your permission to use your desktop folder, your documents folder. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of checkboxes when you're setting up this um, application just to, to authorize the software to, to get what it needs to, to be able to write to your hard disk and be able to see the DV deck that's attached. Uh, so as we've uh, gone forward with this, like we've, we just found like in a recent operating system that you know, we, could, we could ask the user for what the file path is of the DV file they're gonna record, and then we can ask for permission from the operating system to record that. Um, but in DB Rescue, when we're recording a DB stream, we also have to record some sidecar files, like an XML file and uh, some other types of uh, logging data. Uh, so we realized it's a bit easier to just ask for permission to write to an entire folder and then write the DB files and the metadata files as, as we need, uh, rather than then to kind of iterate through like all these different permissions for output files for the same action. So. Originally in DB Rescue, the, the output file dialog looked like this, where you picked a folder and a file name. Yeah. Uh, but now it's a bit separated. You pick the folder you're going to record to, and then you name the DB file that you're going to make. So this is a bit similar to the way Live Capture Plus recorded before, where it asked for a folder and then just kind of like a, a base of an output file name, and then would store everything according to that. Uh, so we've been working with that lately, and that seems to get around the, the current um, security challenges that we have. Uh, but in DB Rescue, like we're trying to show as much information from the camera, even, I mean, from the DB deck, even if it's in record or press forward mode. So um, even on these like basic deck controls where we're not recording, uh, we're still trying to access that video information just so the user can see what they're doing and access the deck. Uh, so yeah, that's why it needs permission, even if it's not necessarily going to record. Hi, so now that you've heard a little bit about some of the technical decisions and development of DV Rescue, we wanted to give a little bit of a practical application example about how some of these tools can really help you. Since capturing DV in its raw form offers many advantages to the preservation of embedded metadata, but this necessitates some thought into how to package and store that data. 
Uh, the simplest situation would be, for example, one continuous file created from one continuous recording on a tape. However, due to the wide range of possibilities for recording on DV, uh, the simplest situation isn't often the one that you always have. Alongside with more straightforward things like timecode and recording breaks that might influence how you would handle the storage of your transferred DV data, single tapes can present quite a varied combination of attributes. This includes the potential for multiple aspect ratios, audio track arrangements, and sample rates all in the same program stream. One of our favorite examples provided by Bay Area Video Coalition, thanks guys, is this one shown below where we had a tape that was a nature documentary that was predominantly 4.3 video with an audio sample rate of 32 kilohertz that was periodically interspersed by footage in a 16.9 aspect ratio with a 48 kilohertz sample rate. With DV with his embedded metadata is self-descriptive to an extent, but the reality is that different media players will handle files like this in drastically different ways. An example of this would be a player might assume a sample rate for the entire file based off of the sample rate it detects early in the frames. So you could have a file that starts out at 32 kilohertz, but then switches to 48 kilohertz, but a player might play that all back as 32 kilohertz, which uh, can lead to suboptimal results for how your audio sounds. This illustrates how there is a need for a method of handling changes to the stream if you are capturing and archiving DV in its raw form. Along with facilitating the effective packaging of things like recording breaks, which depending on your archive's use case or tape contents, you might handle differently, a possible example being two separate oral history interviews held on the same tape, a system for effectively handling DV tapes containing drastically different recording characteristics is needed. This is where DV Rescue can help. To illustrate some of these options, we will use this very short clip from a 1990s Seattle City Light production. Note that there is a scene change from the dancing to a pair of people waving. This is what we will focus on in our next steps. Here is that SAM clip dropped into the DV Rescue app. We will be focusing on the segmenting options at the upper right hand side of your screen. You'll see that there are options for segmenting rules, which will allow you to apply different logic to how or if to split up your DV file for packaging and the scene advance how those would affect the outputs. These include options for splitting on recording start markers, recording time breaks, breaks in the video's timecode, as well as choices for how to behave on changes in aspect ratio and audio settings. Going back to the sample clip, note that the section at the bottom right of the screen, which displays the possible splits that DV Rescue has detected from the metadata versus the current single section under our segmentation options. Should we export this file with these settings, we would end up with a single output file in the same manner as your single input file. Depending on the tape, this is probably often the desired result, but let's say your use case involves splitting out separate pieces of footage for archiving. Remember the scene change between the people dancing and the people waving. Let's see what happens when we select the option to segment the input file based on recording time breaks. Note that we now have two sections in the segmentation portion of the screen, and that clicking on the second one brings up the scene where the edit was made for the people waving. DV Rescue has applied the selection to the embedded metadata and is previewing what it would look like to segment the input file at that location. By clicking Reset, you can select different segmentation choices and experiment with your packaging options to see which makes the most sense in your context. In the example of the clip with a more drastic difference, such as audio or aspect ratio changes, DV Rescue allows you to select choices such as forcing the display of the package file to the most commonly used characteristic within the file. It should be noted that this is done within the file wrapper, leaving the archival DV stream itself unmodified so this is not a destructive process. Lastly, let's take a quick look at the actual packager for DV Rescue, where you can take what you have been doing in analysis and finalize your file outputs. The Packager screen contains many similar features to the Analysis screen in that it allows you to select segmentation rules and see a preview of split locations sans a video preview. DV Rescue supports either MOV or MKV as the file wrapper for your outputs, which can be selected with the options at the top of the screen. Once you have finalized your decisions, clicking Package kicks off the process and will result in the creation of fully packaged output versions of your input DV file. With this amount of flexibility in packaging, DV Rescue supports robust archival workflows that allow you to both preserve and take advantage of the extensive embedded metadata contained in DV streams. Hopefully this quick breakdown helped to illustrate that a bit, but we encourage you to try it out for yourself. And my apologies for the abrupt change of background here, I ran into the hazards of recording in a school of music practice space. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some stuff that's in the works right now. So it's not in the current daily build, but we're trying to like resolve the remaining issues and get it in there soon. So one of those things is to be able to show the errors as the capture is happening. So for instance, like I showed the capture interface before, but we're trying to add this kind of scrolling error bar underneath where it shows this kind of QC tools like view of how many errors are happening per frame over time. So this uh, little graph here kind of shows you the last uh, five minutes or so and shows you how many errors are going by. 
So if you, for instance, have a head clog where half of your frame ends up becoming filled with errors, it would kind of spike on this graph all the way to one direction or, or the other. In these kind of instances, it would be kind of important to stop the deck, rewind, clean your deck, and try to retransfer because here's where it's the most likely to make an improvement. Uh, DV tape is, you know, it's obviously very small and fragile, so the error rate that you'd get is rarely going to be completely perfect, but this is a place where you can get an impression on how your transfer is doing while it's in progress without having to wait for it to completely finish uh, to move it over into the analysis tab. Another feature which I think is going to be complete soon is uh, this process of trying to rewind and recapture automatically parts of the tape that have uh, damage or have errors. So I've shown in an, a couple of prior presentations this feature of merging DV recordings so that if you have more than one DV file from the same tape, uh, DV Rescue can correlate the matching frames together and if there's an error in one frame, it can see in the second copy if that frame has errors there too, and assemble together a copy that mixes the best of all the recordings. And often, with this merging process, you can reduce the error rate of a DV transfer substantially, like sometimes almost getting like a completely perfect transfer um, because of merging together multiple copies, whereas a perfect transfer might be quite unlikely uh, on a single pass. So the feature we're working on right now, which I hope is uh, like finished and into the daily builds by the time this recording is up, is to do this during the initial capture. So the idea here is that the software would read the tape, and when it finds an error, it would keep reading the tape through the errors until those errors go away or the tape ends. And then it would rewind the tape to the point where the errors began and recapture and then merge together just those two parts. So if the frames are good, they only need to be read once, uh, but if a frame comes with an error, it would be read again and merged against the first copy as a way to just kind of like reduce the errors as it went. Uh, this concept is used in a lot of other uh, digital media formats like uh, sector DVDs um, and like hard drives where like a process will be reading the data and checking it and rereading it if need be. Uh, so it's been interesting to kind of apply, apply that to digital tape where there's the information in the recording to do that. Uh, but we just need like the software to kind of, kind of coordinate uh, deck control and data merging in order to improve this process. Uh, so we're hoping that this would be something that you'd configure and turn on or off in uh, the GUI. Because uh, for instance, if you were if you didn't want to like shuttle over your tape and rewind over a potentially damaged spot, you could turn that off if you were cons if you were worried about how fragile the tape was. Um, but otherwise, if you don't mind having a multiple pass over the same section, you might be able to potentially reduce the damages, uh, the error rate of that capture substantially. As I mentioned, one of the components of DB Rescue was and continues to be developing and piloting universal training materials and tools for ready deployment using our partner institutions as a test group. As the tools enter their final stages, we're currently working to finalize materials and add them to the DB Guidance page in order to keep the images and instructions as up to date as possible. In order to provide accessible training and guidance to the archival community, our goal was and is to produce documentation that addresses all learning styles and skill levels. DV Guidance comprises a sort of encyclopedia for all facets of DV videotape preservation. The documentation is and will continue to become available in both on and offline formats. We're providing video, audio, textual, and visual examples and instructions to address the following topics. Background and history of DV, DV formats guide, training videos and documentation, transfer station setup instructions, shopping lists, deck guides, file care, or post-capture best practices, capturing best practices, artifact identification and solutions, glossary, and additional resources. In order to empower organizations not currently digitizing in-house, to set up DB workstations or to assist with the workflow improvement and maintenance for those who are, we've compiled resources to make the process simple, cheap, and easy. These are currently available online and this is an example of the PDF offline format. While all of these sections will be updated as needed to accommodate changes and reflect improvements and modifications, some of them will be contribution-based living documents such as this deck guide. 
This will be a fantastic collaboration opportunity similar to AV Artifact Atlas to have people add to this list with additional decks accompanied with their experiences and the specifics of each one. Currently online are our setup instructions and transfer recommendations for all operating systems including Mac, Linux, and Windows. These instructions include specific details for all possible configurations, cords, and adapters needed for all deck outputs and available parts on multiple generations of computers. Andrew will provide more details about how to access these resources online. Okay, now that we've talked about the tool and the project, let's talk a little bit about where you can find it on the web. There are a few different websites you should know about, which all for the most part cross-reference each other, so they should hopefully be easy to find. These are the DB Rescue project page, which is a centralized home for the project, the DB Rescue GitHub page, which is where the code lives and where you can report any issues you might have, the media area page, which is where you can download all the versions of the tool, and the DB Rescue Google Drive, which is where the living documentation development goes on. I'll provide a very quick overview of each resource, and we have links here, which clearly you can't click because this is a video, but we'll be sharing our slides so you'll be able to access these in the future. The first resource we're looking at is the project page. This is where you can find all the components of the project compiled together. It contains both instructions for downloading and using DV Rescue, as well as a variety of information to help you with the preservation and archiving of DV materials in general. These include things such as compiled lists of DV players with information about their respective compatibilities, as well as training videos to help with the physical aspects of DV preservation. Our goal is to facilitate DV preservation in a holistic manner and to present information to support a variety of learning styles. This information is largely built in the Google Drive folder for DB Rescue, so if you want to see it in its most raw form, that is your place to go poke around in. The next important website to be aware of is the DB Rescue GitHub repository. This is where the code for the tool itself lives and is where you can file issues to interact with the development team. Please do this and don't be shy. As an open source project, we encourage and rely on comments and interaction from our community to help the tool realize its full mission. Release versions of the tool are available at the Media Area website, this is where you will want to go to actually install the program. Here you can install it, the most recent stable releases, as well as daily snapshots of the current development versions for a variety of systems. That's a lot of information covered quickly, but as I said earlier, for the most part, these resources are cross-linked and reference each other, so don't stress about trying to remember them all. Lastly, I want to point you to the initial development page for Digital Video Commander, a follow-up project to DV Rescue. Libby will be talking more about this project next, but just know that the documentation development is proceeding in a similar fashion to DV Rescue, and there is currently a web page that has links to information and tools that Libby will discuss. The work completed for DV Rescue has unearthed a broader need in the archival community to expand current analog workflows to address the unique characteristics and issues that impact a variety of additional digital videotape formats. Thanks to renewed financial support from NEH, our new project, Digital Video Commander, will build on our findings during the early stages of DB Rescue. This expansion project will entail two additional years of work to develop open source and freely available software, user research and testing, and create documentation to help define and perform comprehensive, automated, and easy-to-use data migration techniques. We will continue working with nine partner institutions currently collecting digital videotape to conduct research, define preservation workflows, establish standards, and develop the most impactful tools for capturing content from these additional digital videotape formats, as well as enhance the tools created as part of DV Rescue. Digital videotape deserves and requires a fundamentally different approach. Whereas calibration of the signals from a played analog videotape are essential prior to digitization to ensure Ensure that the resulting digital file represents the full quality and potential of the recording. Such manipulation is detrimental to playing back digital videotape since it is already digital. Adjusting the brightness, color, or volume of a digital videotape may still be helpful. However, such adjustments could be more easily applied to a resulting digital file, whereas not calibrating an analog videotape could result in irrevocable loss. Our research within the DB Rescue project has proven opportunities to preserve DB tapes more reliable by developing software that works with the videotape player to gather the more accurate and complete representation of the DV tape's contents. By applying a similar process as sector-based disk migration, we believe we'll be able to capture a more complete file from other digital videotapes. As indicated by the name, the process operates by copying the source file sector by sector, re-scanning as it encounters an error. Rather than simply recording a file of what a video player is presenting, the recording software coordinates the entire process by assessing the data continuously, controlling the player to make second attempts as needed, or guiding the user through easy-to-follow corrective actions. The Digital Video Commander project extends these findings from DV to all digital videotape formats. An initial task for the Digital Video Commander project involved building customized cables, 
So far, we have successfully established best practices and instructions for two versions of the cable. These cables enable remote deck control, as we have established with DB Rescue for controlling DB decks. Using the 9-pin remote port on the back of any deck, these cables allow not only digital videotape decks to communicate remotely with the Sony 9-pin command line tools, but enable basic operating functions to be executed for any connected deck, such as play, fast-forward, rewind, stop, and eject. Version 1 of the Digital Video Commander cable is less time-consuming and requires fewer supplies to build, but it is a little messy and the wires can come loose more easily during transport. This is easily resolved, but it is a factor to consider. Version 2 requires additional supplies, time, and a basic understanding of wiring, but the result is a more durable and sleek design similar to the other various AV cables we are used to. Both of these cables are relatively inexpensive and straightforward to assemble. For both, we have developed documentation that includes a list of supplies, a wiring map, and step-by-step -step assembly instructions. Later in this project, we'll be creating demonstration videos for cable building, deck cleaning, as well as how to use the tool sets for DB Rescue and Digital Video Commander. Instructions for building these cables can be found on the Digital Video Commander documentation website, along with instructions for setting up connections between decks and computers for all operating systems and draft documentation for testing your cable using the Sony 9-pin command line tool. As Libby noted, one of the central discoveries of the DV Rescue project has become a stepping stone for the new Digital Video Commander project that we're just beginning work on. We found that we can improve the migration of DV data from DV tape by selectively rereading parts of the tape of errors more than once and combining the results according to the embedded error status information. So we'll be working to extend this approach to formats such as beta cam, uh, digital beta cam, beta cam SX, and HD cam. This project has shown us a new concept of transferring data from videotape. The traditional approach involves an assembly line of processes where the videotape plays a signal that the computer receives and records. In this new approach, the computer software orchestrates the capture event, commanding the video deck to play, receive, and evaluate the content and request the deck to rewind and retry if errors are found. And or orchestrates like receiving frames and deck control evaluation to come up with the best output possible. So rather than the computer diligently writing all the data it receives, the software is more active and controls the deck as needed, potentially in multiple passes, in order to make the transfers more accurate than would be possible in a single pass. With this approach, the software could even stop writing the data and ask the user to clean the deck if uh, head clogging issues are detected, and then synchronize the tape back to where it left off and continue. With DV, the error codes are clearly embedded within the DV stream that's transferred over Firewire, and each frame is identified with those time codes and absolute track numbers. With formats such as Digital Betacam and Betacam SX, which would be transferred over SDI, there's, there are new challenges in doing the work to identify the tape transfer errors and determining the identity of every frame so that we could match frames across multiple passes. And then we also need to create a new open, reproducible, and accessible way to do deck control. Um, so that's one of the earliest challenges in this project that we started to address. Uh, so I'd like to go into that in a bit more detail. So in the DV Rescue project, we used a variety of tools such as DVCont and our own development to send control codes over Firewire uh, to the deck to do two things. The first would be to control the deck, such as making it take action, such as stop, play, rewind, and fast forward. Uh, the second thing that this uh, interaction does is query the deck, um, asking it for information like the model name, the time code of the current frame, and the settings of the deck. So we have this kind of interaction resolved with DV in the DV Rescue project, but we, will, we need to do this with digital Betacam decks, Betacam SX decks, and others. Um, so in order to use a computer to control a deck, often we're using a video capture card. So for instance, the Blackmagic Ultra Studio offers a remote output, so you can connect the Ultra Studio Express to the deck with a 9-pin cable, and then you can control the deck from your computer using Blackmagic software or tools that are integrating Blackmagic software development kit. But many modern capture cards don't have this remote option. And we're, interesting, we're interested in reducing the dependency on specific uh, pieces of proprietary hardware to perform deck control and to create a more affordable, approachable uh, solution, uh, potentially independent from video capture. Uh, so we worked with a developer who had created a set of code for performing deck control uh, with an Arduino. 
um, at this GitHub repository. So we approached um, Heideke to see about extending uh, the work here to remove the Arduino dependency. Um, it's because we wanted to get to the smallest set of hardware uh, possible to have a computer and a deck interact together. So eventually through collaboration, sponsored development, lots of testing and building upon other open source building blocks, um, we eventually developed a command line program that was able to do deck control with a specific set of hardware. This is what our prototype cable looked like. Uh, this uses a USB to RS-422 adapter a DE 9-pin breakout board, and then uh, jumper cables that I borrowed from my son's Raspberry Pi kit uh, to connect the two devices together with a custom mapping uh, that would work with the Sony 9-pin protocol. The other thing I wanted to show off here is like, be beyond just controlling the deck, we also want to query it for information. Um, so in our query results right now, this is how we're detecting the information that comes back from the deck. So it tells us information about if the deck is in local or remote mode, if the tape is in there, um, what the mode is of the tape, like if it's actively playing or fast forwarding. Um, we're able to ask for various types of time code. So uh, we're really excited to like get this kind of raw information back from the deck and determine like how we're going to use that and capture it before or during a transfer.